But the ter- be- obviously being an Englishman, um, where I grew up, lots of the old boys used to have uh, allotments. You know, allotments like a little patch of land, and they have a little shed on it, and that way they can get away from the nagging wife, and they plant their vegetables. And anyway, they always used to have a scruffy terrier kicking about. You know, it would be a, a wire-haired fox terrier or a, a scruffy patterdale terrier. And it's it's just part of the culture that, you know, you've got this grumpy, snappy sort of terrier that would uh, keep any rodents and critters down around the around the allotments. And, you know, they could go off rabbiting or ratting at the weekends, a bit of fun. It's, it, it, you know, a, an easy, harmless, easy dog to keep. And it's, it's useful, you know. So I was brought up that every kennels used to have, you know, a scruffy dog somewhere, you know, kicking about. And uh, I remember years ago, I, I, I was visiting a, visiting a litter of pups. This was the sort of late 80s. And um, the same thing, the guy, uh, he had this nice litter of Stafford pups. And out the back, he had, you know, the, the litter of Stafford pups had a nice little sort of box with a lamp and a nice bit of carpet, and it was all nicely done. And I remember at the, the back, we walked up his garden, and in the bottom shed, there was like a cardboard box with a bit of straw in it. And there was a, a patterdale in there with her litter of pups. So it was literally, you know, that's a that's a rough and tough dog. Let it get on with it. And, the, you know, the sort of more pampered dog was the sort of Stafford. But. So funnily enough, I always used to like the scruffy patterdales. You know, I'm not, I got some short haired ones here, but I mean, it's, uh, I quite like the sort of scruffy, scruffy ones. And... Um, as as it, I think I told this story before, but I was in Marseille, uh, and uh, a guy that you know, I work with, stonemason kennels. He said to me one day, um, "Do you know anything about Patadel terriers?" And uh, I was like, "You know, I'm in Marseille. You know, it's, it's sort of forty degrees in the summer, and this guy's talking to me about Patadel terriers." And I said, yeah, of course I do. And he said, well, my brother-in-law's got a couple of Patterdale Terriers and they just had a litter. Do you want one? And I said, yeah, all right, where you go. So I, I brought one into the house, Bullet, little dog, and um, wonderful little dog. I mean, I, had, I was living out in the country and I had four acres of vineyard around my place. And the dog was uh, never on a lead or on a chain or whatever. She just did the four corners of the property it wasn't fenced in or anything never went further than the four corners and she basically you know nothing could come onto the land whether it be wild boar or whatever she would you know give voice um and you know quite often she would bring back a rat or you know sort of rabbit or something and uh just an excellent little dog so it's kind of when you're in the, the staffords being a stafford man you very quickly you've been all around and you've done what it is to do and uh, a sort of a, a side sort of street or an offshoot was the Patterdales it was a bit of fun so uh, my good friend Robert Booth who's uh, who's very very well known in the in the in the Patterdale in the Patterdale world as Brian Nuttall has sadly just passed away but Robert Booth is right up there with him he's you know one of these guys that have been in that in that sort of uh, world for about 60, 70 years. And Robert Booth is an Englishman. He lives in France. And funnily enough, the two um, pups, that, uh, or the two dogs that my friend had that had pups came from Robert Booth. And so eventually I got in touch with Robert for maybe getting a male dog. And he said, well, listen, he said, I might have something for you. And a long, long story, but Robert... I was leaving, I sold all my businesses and I was looking to rent a place in the country. And Robert had a big farm to rent uh, over in the Dordogne. Anyway, one thing led to another. I didn't end up renting this farm. He had 50 acres of of, um, hunting land with the farm. And I didn't end up renting that farm. I rented another one. And um, he called me one day and said, oh, I haven't forgot, I've got your pup here. And so... uh, I drove round and he had Mad Frank, which mm. you've obviously sent you the photos, mm-hmm. and he gifted me Mad Frank. And uh, Frank is exactly, uh, you know, what it says on the tin. I mean, ferocious dog, ferocious. 
And um, I was invited here by uh, the president of the, they call it Deterage, it's the, the digging team for badgers. And I was invited to, to bring my dogs along and hunt with them because they'd all heard, they're starting to hear about the Patadale Terrier here, but they all hunt with Yag Terriers or Fox Terriers. Or... And so I was invited along. And first up, I took uh, uh, one of Frank's sons, Gilly, uh, made a very good show of himself. Um, you know, we dug to a, 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 a decent sized badger. Um, the badgers here where we are uh, are above 20 kilos. So when you think your little dog is about eight, nine kilos, it's, uh, it's a bit of a monster. So anyway, we managed to get, um, you know, we dug a couple that day. He made a good sort of show of himself. So the next couple of weeks, uh, I was invited back to bring his dad, Frank, along. And I think it's one of the rare times that someone's actually been excluded from a hunt <laughs> because huh. Frank went to ground looking for, you know, looking for Brock, looking for Badger, came up empty. There was nothing in the set. So he came out another, uh, another hole, if you like, and uh, decided, well, he'd pick a fight with a couple of Fox Terriers. Yeah. So <laughs> we yeah, so we were politely asked not to come back. So Frank made a good show of himself, but no, no, he's, they said no, he's, 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 he's too much, too much. Mm -hmm. But so Frank was put to uh, uh, a couple of friends of mine in Portugal hunt a lot with their, with their dogs. They were in partnership. And um, they, they gifted me a couple of females, you know, um, here so i put frank across them and it's, it's produced very very nice dogs all good workers um the few litters i've done with frank and the and the two reefer and roller they've all gone off to working homes they've all made good shows of themselves but sadly as always happens uh they start picking up popularity and becoming fashionable so we're starting to get people now um, ringing and, and they want in patadales for pets, patadales for sofa dogs, you know, and they are probably one of the last workers with the Yag Terriers and the patadales. They're probably one of the really last working terriers that exist. Other terriers like the border terriers and stuff, they do work, but um, you know, the minute they become popular, the price goes up, the quality goes down. And uh, and sadly, uh, in France now, they're becoming popular. I see a couple of pages going up on Facebook and stuff, and and more and more people are producing, buying, producing, and and you know where that's going to end up. So I've got some nice dogs on the yard, but I've taken my foot off the gas, if you like, and I'm I'm only going to do a litter every now and again now, purely if I've got the demand for it. But uh, what I don't want to do is see. Uh, you know, a, a decent sort of fiery, spicy terrier like that go down the same the same trip as uh, the Jack Russells, for example. You know, find a decent Jack Russell today is just like, you know, looking for hen's teeth. So you know, the Patadales, good, honest, scruffy workers, you know, um, but they're becoming more and more popular. So I guess that's just the, just the way it is. As soon as a dog of any breed, you know, starts getting popular on social media or whatever they post a few photos suddenly it becomes uh, the snowball effect yeah but but that, that's the shame but I, like i said i got frank's son uh, rex he was sold to um, some travelers because they like um catching hedgehogs and they cook hedgehogs apparently hedgehogs are a delicacy i've never tasted hedgehog meat but apparently it's a, a, it's a delicacy anyway so they wanted um, wanted a patadel for, for, for catching hedgehogs. And the guy rang me about a year later and said, can you come and take it back? He, you know, we're living near a golf course and he keeps escaping and going across the golf course and killing things and leaving them on the, the 18th hole, you know? <laughs> so, so when the guys are, you know, uh, uh, coming along for their, their round of golf, they're finding sort of these corpses everywhere. So they didn't want any more hassle. So he said, can you come and pick him up? So that's Rex, and I posted a photo of Rex today. He's, um, you know, very, very worthy uh, son of Mad Frank. He's 
crazy, crazy dog. So, like I said, when it happens like that and they come back, they stay at my place. He's not going anywhere. So, right. So that's like, but that, you know, basically the terriers it was just a sort of diversion for me, a bit of fun. You know, the Stafford. Even though I, I, you know, I'm serious about what I do in the Staffords and I take it fairly seriously and have to produce and select and, and, and you know, stay on the right tracks. Patterdales are a bit of fun. You know? I see there's um, Patterdales are becoming very popular out in the States now. So yeah. I see there's one or two guys starting to uh, starting to get into it. I think it's, the, you know, it's the same sort of um, kind of the same thrill as the old sort of dog men used to get, you know, with the, with the pit dogs, you know, the gameness. You know, they've got good noses. So, I mean, I get people here asking me patterdales for wild boar. And um, no, wild boar is too big. But they've got, they've got good noses so they could track, they could track and maybe flush them out, you know, into, into the, the path of the, the guys with guns. But if an eight, nine, ten kilo dog comes in contact with a hundred kilo ball, you know, it's going to be like a little handkerchief in the wind. You know, it's, it's even if it latches on, you just have to you'd have to track it over miles to try and find your dog again. So, yeah, it's uh, so I always put, put people off that. Even I had a Stafford or two go off to hunt wild boar, but even Staffords are uh, too small for the job. So, what you really need is the either the the doggos or the um, the bull terrier crosses. They're very good. Uh, you got catch dogs over over in the states. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, if it's old fashioned, there's a couple of friends here that hunt the old fashioned way. You know, with a with a dagger to, to finish the ball. And what you don't need is um, a dog that will let go. And if you've got a very angry paw and you're going to finish him off with your knife and the dog suddenly lets go you know <laughs> it could uh, it could be nasty so i've seen the videos down in the, the deep south in america where they uh, send in the catch dogs that go flying in and uh, explode or so it's, it's impressive but you know it's it's very short-lived i mean you don't get old hunting dogs normally they get banged up enough and stitched up enough and they they, they lead good, honest lives, but I mean, they're pretty short lived. So I, I, used, I used to get invited to the dig in here, but I'll be honest, uh, to, to spend a weekend digging sort of three or four meters down uh, to, to find a badger isn't, it's fascinating, it's tradition, it's wonderful, but I'm too lazy to be digging holes, I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm right there with you, man. I'm right there. Yeah, with you. no, I mean, you've got to be honest. I mean, I appreciate it, and I see the youngsters tearing in there and. Mm ripping out the roots and, you know, really digging for, as if their lives depended on it. And I'm like, nah, fuck that. I'm just too old for all that. <laughs> and I, so, I, I appreciate it. I like to, you know, I, I like to see that the dogs are on the right line. Um, I think, you know, things like ratting in old barns and stuff, that's, that's easier. That's easier. Easier going. But huge respect to the, the guys that, that do the digging. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Weekend in the two guys that I used to dig with were um, they were in their sixties. I mean, these guys had you know forearms like Popeye. I mean, you know, they're pff, amazing. Yeah. You know, they were just you know like JCBs. They were digging into ground. I mean, one of the digs we did, it was in the side of a bank, and it was alive with ants. And uh, no stopping these guys. They were straight in there digging through the ants, past the ants to get down to where they needed to go. I'm like, you know, you've really got to fancy that, fancy your job, you know? Yeah. But, but no, 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 but like I say, we talk about honest bulldogs and honest terriers. You don't get more honest than a real scruffy Patterdale terrier. I mean, they're just bomb proof, excellent dogs. So, but unfortunately, whenever they become popular, the quality drops. So we <laughs> shall see. We shall see what happens with them, but. I've noticed in the last few years here, they've become more and more popular, uh, more and more people. And what you don't need is, I had a couple of guys in Paris telling me that they wanted Patterdales and they were going to go on digs with, with you know, professional people. Because here, it's legal to, to dig to badger in certain seasons, but you've got to do it right. I mean, it's not the... 
the guys with a few cans of lager that are you know going to send their dogs into a hole and cross their fingers you know so th- those types of guys are what you know give the, the whole thing a bad name but um i had a couple of guys in, in paris saying that they wanted to you know to, to learn this and that so i gave them some addresses and six months later the dogs were back up for sale again you know so right. um, not serious not serious so i think it, it was one of the best kept secrets you know keep it under wraps the patadels you know patadels are for the countrymen know a good dog use you know use them correctly uh, vermin control yeah, I think it should stay like that. The minute they become popular is uh, is a nightmare. I had a guy the other day ring me. He, he had a patadale from me, chuffed to bits with it, and he said to me, can you find me a working Labrador? Because he wanted to do some, you know, the, the ducks, the duck shoot. Mm-hmm. And I said, um, let me get back to you on that one. Well, you know what? I just couldn't find any kennels of working Labradors to send him. That's another breed that, became hugely successful, popular, and just went down the pan. I mean, to find a, a, a you know, a classy working Labrador really is a, is a job. So, so I don't know. I, I said to him, I'll get back to you, and I still haven't found anything. So nope. th- this is, you know, we always come back to the same thing. Most breeds, decent working breeds that are a little bit sharp yeah. are dampened down. They dampen down the character yeah. to sell them to the general public. So yeah. that's, we always come back to the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. If a dog's too spiky, too too fiery, it, we, they dampen it down, whether it be crossbreeding or just selecting the more docile over a few generations. And you just, you know, you get watered down versions of whatever breed, which is, which is a cry and shame. And then people, you know, further on down the line say well you know these aren't what they were or you know the the dog's not what it says on the tin you know it's uh you got it with staffords you've got it with uh got it with all sorts of things but uh Uh, but that's good i mean if you've got people that don't spoil those breeds and they stay like that then they they stay exclusive that's excellent and i think we should stop talking about them so they don't get spoiled right (laughs) so so what about the um yeah, like I said, I mean, the, the guy, the, getting back to the Terriers, the president of the club here, for 30 years he's been breeding fox terriers, wire-haired fox terriers, and he was breeding worker to worker, and he's got about 30-odd dogs on his yard, and he said out of the 30, there's probably only about seven or eight that hunt now. The rest don't want to go to ground. Wow. He said, so after 30-odd years, the guy why he invited me along because he wanted to have a look at this what is this english breed of patterdale etc but he said even with selection worker to worker it's slowly sort of you know fallen out of favor there's more and more dogs that just aren't interested don't want to go to ground and uh, there's not enough working fox terriers for example in the area for him to do an outcross or look for something else and so after 30 years of, of, of work, he's, he's looking to change the breed, which, mm. you know, I think is a crying shame. But, um, and this is where, you know, the, the popularity of the Jag Terrier came in because the, the German hunting terrier was just, the, you know, kamikaze, crazy dogs, and that did the job. But um, unfortunately, the French brought in, imported a lot. And the guys, you know, from the... the the eastern countries that were sending them over obviously weren't sending the good ones they were keeping those for themselves so you've got second third rate yak terriers coming to france that were all bred together so now it's you know a bit of a banal dog you know you get good ones but a a lot of bad ones as well so the hunters and the bits and pieces are looking for the next best thing so they're uh they're going to the Patadales, they're going, you know, they're, they're looking everywhere to see if they can still keep that, that working uh, instinct, you know, to the fore. So, but it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't, haven't traveled with, with the life's commitments at the house and the kennels and all the rest of it. I haven't got out and about as much as I like. But, um, but from what I, I, you know, there are a few teams of, of, of terrier men working in France. And I think that pretty much the Patadels are alive and well. But uh, I think they suddenly be, you know, became 
they popped up on the radar and suddenly people wanted this dog. I want a dog like that, but I want him nice on the sofa. You know, so it's, um, which I think a few years ago, two, a couple of years ago when we spoke about this, it was, it was good and looking promising, but unfortunately it's, uh, like I said, it popped up on the radar and yeah. a lot of people want these dogs for the wrong reasons now. So, so anyway, that's, that's that. But, you know, I've got a few kicking around in the, in the yard and they're doing their job, it should. And, uh, you know, they keep down those rodents from behind the, uh, the hen houses. So they're earning their keep. Good enough for me. Patadale and a fell terrier. Basically, they're the one and the same. Mm-hmm. Um, the fell terriers um, and Patadale terriers. Patadale is a place in England. Um, and the old boys used to refer to the broken coated sort of uh, terriers in the north, uh, in the Lake District, in the also the rocky areas right up north before Scotland, um, they used to refer to the just as fell terriers. It's just a general term mm-hmm. uh, because don't forget, any working terrier isn't really pure bred. Yeah, you know mm-hmm. uh, that they, they got a little bit of, of everything mixed in. You know, so you got you know t- some that look like Lakeland terriers, some look like Welsh terriers. You got, you know, it's basically, does the dog work? And if it does, it does, you know. Mm-hmm. Patterdale is a general term from the place it was supposed to have come from. And fell terrier is more of a sort of general term over over everything to, you know, for the sort of rough, scruffy head dogs. But um, it's, it's a term that's not, you know, back in the UK, yeah, it's used by the, the old boys, but today people refer them just as Patterdales. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, Fell terriers are just, you know, for fell terriers, uh, uh, that sort of type of terrier, you know. But um, oh. but again, you know, it's uh, it's like the Wheaton terriers out in Ireland. I mean, a real Wheaton terrier is, is something to behold. I mean, it's just hell on four legs. So the Wheatons were crossed into all sorts of breeds, so I'd add, add fire to them. But I think it's what the Wheaton terrier, I think, was one of the oldest terriers in Ireland. And, um, you know, I've heard of Wheaton Terriers being rolled against pit bulls and winning, you know. So yeah. uh, it, it's you've got a few of them popping up on the um, on the uh, the social media now. Some a lot of boys working them, but uh, again, as you said about the Cheese Peak being feisty, a Wheaton Terrier isn't for a family dog, you know. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> They're extremely fiery so yeah. it, it, it it's the same thing it's you know you want these dogs to uh to work and do a job and uh and that's that's what they should have been bred for and selected for but uh, after the minute they get sort of onto the pet market then everything goes goes down prices go up and quality goes down so. but right. the yag terriers i mean i like them they're very smart smart scruffy i like the the, the broken coated mm-hmm. uh, yag terriers but the all the ones i've met are they are just all they want to do is work i mean if you have them in the kennel they will scream the kennels down you know most guys here have electric collars on them you know just to, to try and calm them down because they are hysterical they just want to work and they are fearless i mean totally fearless they will go into anything and the only trouble with that is, I my this is just my personal opinion. I, the Patterdale, um, he kind of reflects on the situation. You know, he's a ten kilo dog. He's underground. He's up against a twenty five kilo badger. He's not going to go in all guns blazing because he's going to come off second best. So he'll probably give voice. He'll give voice, and this is where you know an experienced terrorman, a terrorman. Uh, knows where to dig but a yag terrier just loves to go into contact you know and so unfortunately this is why the vets in the country open on a sunday because uh that is for the breakages they call it so in french they call it uh, the lacasse when that when the uh you know the dogs get opened up up you have to take them in <laughs> to get stitched up and, and saved on, on a sunday you know mm-hmm. so the same thing, wild boar, they'll go straight in for wild boar. They just have no fear. I mean, it's you have to admire the courage, but it's that kind of kamikaze spirit that is too much. You know, your dog will 
happily go into war with all guns blazing and without thinking. So, you know, you, you, could, you could go hunting with sort of five dogs and come back with three. So from what I've seen, the Patterdale is, a, I wouldn't say more intelligent. He just reflects, he thinks more. Mm. So you know, he's thinking, all right, how am I going to deal with this one? So they're clever little dogs. They can be yappy as well in the kennels. They yap. Um, they're very, very alert when you live in the country like I do. If something that, you know passes by in the field behind, you know, three o'clock in the morning, they're going to fire up. So they are a bit of a pain in the butt, as all terriers. You know, they can be a little bit vocal. But the um, it's like the Yag Terriers for me are the, the serious dogs. They were bred for serious work. But... They became popular. They became show dogs as well. So then there's almost two lines been formed now. There's the pretty ones that can, you know, win the rosettes. And then there's the scruffy, you know, scarred up working ones that, you know, uh, work at the weekends. So um, what I would say is, uh, I wouldn't say more of a serious dog than the Patterdale, but um, they are a handful. I wouldn't advise anyone to get you know, to say, well, I want a pet dog, I'll get a, a Yag Terry. Yeah. No, pro- probably not the best idea. But uh, from what I've seen, you know, um, as we said for crossing, if, if, if so a lot of people put a touch of a Yag Terrier into their Patterdales just to, to spice it up a bit right. uh, with good results, you know. But, um, but uh, again, I, out of the two, I think the sort of... Uh, the Patterdales are the sensible ones out of the two. So, but again, that's just my, uh, my take on it from what I've seen. Yag is all business. Yeah. It's just, I mean, the guys I knew down south that hunted with uh, with Yag Terrors, they, you know, it's a very versatile dog. Uh, they're actually getting a little bit too big now to, to go to ground. Um, some of the Yag Terriers we get here are 14, 15 kilos. You know, they're starting to get big dogs, you know. Um, but it's again, it's an all-purpose dog, very versatile. It can do wild boar, as it can do, you know, uh, young deer, as it can do, you know. So they're, they're the all-purpose dog of the terrier world. So, you know, we always refer to the Staffordshire Bull Terrier as being the all-purpose dog. Yag terriers in the hunting world, a good yag can pretty much adapt to everything, you know. Mm-hmm. Whereas I always say that patterdales should be digging dogs. You know, they should be dogs for going to ground. Even though they have good noses, um, you know, they're, they're very useful. But horses for courses, you know, the, the Yag Terrier was the German hunting terrier. It was, it was you know, sort of uh, created to, to take on all comers. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Yag for the serious, serious man. Patterdale is a little, little more forgiving, I'd say. Jax, it's a shame because Jax are good little dogs. But they've just been just been sort of uh, made into sort of um, little couch dogs now, mm-hmm. you know, so they're little cute little, you know, circus dogs roll on their back, play dead, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's a shame because I, I know people that still work them every now and again, but again, it's, it's almost the, the, the working side of Jack Russell's is shunned now. No, no, it's a cute dog. Mm-hmm. You know, it's cute. It's, it's more for sort of, uh, publicity and uh just sort of cute things on instagram and you know it's we want it for the children and it's it's suddenly become fashionable and they put it into the sort of toy category now where they're you know they're cute little dogs even though they're they're still fiery they still got that fiery ancestry to them but they they're considered as uh as no 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 we don't want jack russell's working no they're, they're cute fox terriers never got to the cute sort of section because they st- they are still very grumpy, very feisty. I mean, the, the two that I saw working when I was uh, was invited, they were 11, 12 years old and they were still working. Wow. I mean, but again, not nice dogs. You couldn't go over and scratch them behind the ears. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they bite you the same as they bite, you know, a badger. They weren't nice. They were grumpy. They were vocal. They didn't even look nice, you know. They, but but hey, it's, it's you know they're working dogs. But uh, you know the guy that would have, he'd take his pack out, 
and they're sort of, you know, strung out between the trees, and then and now it's your turn, and now it's your turn, but they're expected to work. So, but uh, again, in a way, it's it's more honest. They're there for working, and they do a job. Jack Russell's, unfortunately, of uh, what was it? It was the Jim Carrey movie that made them popular. Was it The Mask? Right. Something. Yeah, it's, it's the death of any breed as soon as they hit Hollywood. You know, it's uh, the Stafford, like the Keanu Reeves has had a blue Stafford or something. So there you go. Thanks very much. <laughs> so the minute, yeah, the minute the dogs hit Hollywood or whatever, everybody goes, oh, I want a dog like that. You know, Dalmatians, whatever. So, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the Jack Russells, you can you really have to find now uh, decent ones. Um, they made the, they got a recognised uh, breed now. The Patterdales have always fought against being recognised. Jack Russells became recognised, so now they're a thousand pound a pup. Um, the laws have changed, so now you can't dock the tails. So, um, Obviously, working dogs, you can dock the tails yourself. Uh, vets, there are a few that will do it for you, but, you know, it's very hush-hush. Uh, but now when you've got a Jack Russell that has paperwork on it, it's not allowed to have its tail, top, um, uh, tail docked. Mm-hmm. So you've got these Jack Russells now with like these big ant- antennas, you know, trying to sort of pick up Wi-Fi. So <laughs> it... it it's like the Dobermans. Dobermans with the tail and the droopy ears now. It just really, you know, sort of, you know, takes the fear factor out of it. When you used to see Dobermans in The Exorcist and all the old horror films, you know, and, uh, you know, they look scary dogs with the ears cropped and the, 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 the tails cropped. And now they've left them all on. They look just sort of dopey dogs, you know, like like Goofy in the, the Disney thing. But... Um, but yeah, like I say, the uh, Jack Russells unfortunately went a little bit down the pan. Fox Terriers haven't yet met that fate. Uh, Patterdales are coming a little bit too popular for my liking. Yag Terriers are just the, you know the psychopaths of the the terrier world. So you know that even though they you know there there are show lines now as well. Very serious dog, very serious dog. But again, Wheaton Terriers. Wheaton Terriers are probably the most extreme. You, to find a decent Wheaton is very, very hard. And, you know, they're not for everybody. But again, you know, you, if, if you wanted to and you took interest, I know a lady that had Border Terriers who shows them. She even shows them at Crufts, but then she'll work them at the weekends as well. And I mean, she's really, but she's on her own. She's doing it. She's a lady out here. She's got a house here and a house in Italy. And um, she's doing a very, very good job. But, you know, she's fighting against the tide, you know. it's um, She's looked down upon because she works at Border Terriers when, you know, she's the one keeping that flame alive. But uh, it's, uh, you know, from what I've seen, she's doing a very good job. I think so. I think it should be commendable, you know. If you're, if you're trying to keep the tradition alive and keep the, the real stuff alive and you can explain, obviously... Um, you know, it's it's not a sales pitch, but you're explaining that you're a purist, and if that's what you're looking for, and you're sure of it, well, there's the place to go. You know, so I mean, border terriers—they went off the boil years ago, and then they suddenly became show dogs. Mm-hmm. And to hear of a border terrier working, I mean, was was you know unheard of. But uh, I met the lady here at, in the back of Beyond. Um, I saw the Border Terrier and he was a little bit marked up. And I looked and I said to her in French, and I said, oh, you know, has he, has he been working? Or well, he got into a tussle. And the, the lady was English. And so we were speaking and she showed the dog and she said to the judge, um, she said, be careful with his underjaw because he was hunting badger yesterday. <laughs> and, um, and the judge sort of snorted and laughed as, as if... And then when he sort of touched and saw that it was swollen and, you know, sore, ah, and the dog won. Fair play to the judge. He actually put him up. Wow. But, um, but yeah, he was shocked. You know, <laughs> a border terrier working. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, she's, um, 
she's uh, I'll send you a link to her, her yeah. stuff she's doing she's doing, doing some good work good work maybe get her on the podcast she might yeah definitely so how'd you end up with the Malinois 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 well basically uh, as I I think I've said before whenever you you breed dogs obviously um you have to live uh, in an isolated place because, you know, dogs will tend to bark um, and you don't want to annoy the neighbours. So you live in an isolated place with a bit of land. And so, you know, that's a double-edged sword. When you live uh, tucked away, unfortunately, you're going to get, uh, especially today, you know, uninvited guests. So you do have to have uh, guard dogs, unfortunately. You know, people are under this illusion that if you're a dog breeder, you've obviously got money laying about, which <laughs> is far from the case. You know, I always say if anybody came in looking for money, I'd help them look for it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, there's obviously if you've got puppies, puppies can be stolen as well and dogs can be stolen and, you know, you hear more and more of it. So what you need is is a guard dog. Now, guard dogs don't necessarily have to be man-eaters. Um, if you've got guard dogs that give voice, um, you know, people that are looking, maybe people that are not fixed on coming into your place, but people that are up to no good, if they hear dogs bark and they'll move on, not because they're scared of dogs, but because, um, you know, the actual fact that the dogs are barking is bringing attention to the place, so they move on. So, you know, you should always have a few guard dogs kicking about. Now, I've always had friends that have had these, the pressing canarios and the, and the kangas and all these giant monster eating dogs. And uh, what I found was most of these big dogs are very, very efficient, but they do tend to sleep a lot, you know? So one of the easiest things to have is a shepherd dog. Now, you know, I've been around all the big breeds and I've seen, you know, lots of kennels use different things to different effects. And um, one of the easiest things is uh, is just to have a shepherd dog. Shepherd dogs were, you know, created to, to herd and to protect the farm at night and to property, you know, guard property. And they are very, very alert and they don't sleep very much mm. uh, and they do the job. So... I had a friend who was breeding Dutch shepherds, um, Hollande, Dutch shepherds. And uh, he gave me a pup years ago. And at eight weeks old, the pup was already switched on, barking at anything that wasn't something to do with the house. Anybody that would come to the house, whether it be postman or whatever, the dog was making a show of himself. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Anyway, he grew up to be just a fantastic guardian and um, I mean I like all dogs but if there was one breed that I was suspicious of it would have been the Belgian Shepherd the Malinois because I always thought they were too nervy you know they would bite you you know just for the fun of it and I thought no I don't want that anyway the Dutch Shepherd was for me I found it more stable a little bit bigger I thought that's good that's for me sadly one day it was only about five or six I went out one day and I said, what dog is that on, on the yard? And it was him. And he'd suddenly become a skeleton. He just just melted overnight. And I thought immediately he'd been poisoned. Oh. And uh, I took him straight to the vet. And, uh, you know, he almost, they couldn't get um, any blood out of his veins. It was that thick. So they, they operated. And in fact, he had a stomach cancer. I mean, uh, extremely aggressive stomach cancer. And most of the, the colon was black. You know, he just went in 24 hours. So sadly, you know, we let him go. So I immediately rang the breeder to say, listen, you know, have you got any other Dutch shepherds? And he said, no, no, but I have got some some Malinois if you want. And I said, oh, no, no, anything but that, you know. Right. And he said, no, no, you know, hear me out. He said, you know, come come over to the kennels and have a look at the dogs. Now, I just don't like these dogs, you know. And... Um, and I went over, so finally he said, listen, take this bitch. She was about a year old. 
and she was fearful and she was nervy and you couldn't get near her and i thought well let's let's bring her to the house and see if she settles down it took me one month to get near this dog to the point of where i was thinking i'm gonna have to get rid of her and, I, and that's against me I, I can't if i take a dog on it stays right. i can't get rid of it but i'm thinking i'm gonna make an exception here because this dog yes she guards the house but she's just so unfriendly you can't get near her she's you know sh and so as luck would have it i had had a litter of stafford pups going off and a guy from the south the breeds melon was he'd bought a bitch from me a bitch stafford and he came um and he came to uh to visit the kennels and he saw uh he saw this dog and he said yeah shame about shame about the nerves but i'm sure you could do something with her and uh he said if you like i've got a nice litter and i'll give you the best male in the litter and uh and anyway he was explaining to me that as a guard dog it's always nice to have a couple because he said he was explaining to me because he said the gypsy lads if you've got a male dog for example they will get a female dog uh which is in heat and they'll rub around the back end with a glove and then they'll come to the, your place when there's no one around and they'll throw the glove that stinks of uh, the female to the ground and the, the most of the males are soppy and they'll be sort of sniffing around the glove as they walk on by and <laughs> walk in to pinch your stuff. <laughs> so he said, the way to get around that is to have a couple. He said, you know, when you've got a couple, it doesn't work. So, uh, you know, I got, you know, two, three acres. So I said, well, yeah, okay. I said, I'll take a male. And uh, another lesson to be learned. Now, I've spent my life around dogs. And if somebody asks me to choose for them, you know, I take my time and I choose exactly what they ask for. Mm -hmm.